put out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 410th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey. That is me, the guy who looks like Sam, Santa Claus and kind of shoddy. And the other one of us is Tom Fennell, who is the amazing Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. And uh, our show this week, our show every week, is about energy and climate change. It's taken from uh, materials that I put together in my blog, geoharvey.com, G-E-O-H-A-R-V-E-Y.com. You can go to the dates that we talk about and click on the the shows there, or you can get to the same shows by by taking a look at the materials that are accompanying the the uh, web uh, shows that you're watching. There's going to be things that you can click on that will download the script that Tom and I use, and also that uh, that um, have have that. Actually, there's two different ways to download it. So, are you ready, Tom? You have something to say, I'm sure. I just wanted to mention that some of these shows, some of these links, some of the articles that we're talking about are very well worth looking at and reading yourself. Absolutely. And in fact, in fact, one of them, there's no way that Tom and I are going to be able to describe it. Um, we're going to talk about what's in it. But if you really want to you want to get the de information, you'd have to go to the link because we're, we we won't have enough time to detail what's in it. Nevertheless, I pull that to your attention, but sometimes I forget. Yeah, I, I'll remember on this particular one. Okay, you set, Tom. We're starting on the 11th of March, which was I a think, Thursday. I, well, we're starting out with a picture of Dillingham, or is it Dillingham? Um, it's it's I don't know. <laughs> if I were an American, I'd call it Dillingham. And if I were British, I'd call it Dillingham. But of course, I don't know what I am, so I don't know what to call it. <laughs> anyway, that particular house is 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 uh, an important issue in this particular article, which came from Clean Technica. So what do you have for a title, Tom? Even in frigid temperatures in Alaska, air source heat pumps keep homes warm. This is this is significant because this has has been changing. Yeah, this is this is in our favor. Yeah, this is something that I found really interesting when I looked at it, because, you know, a lot of the time when I talk to, with people about heat pumps, they say, well, here in Vermont, they're not going to work because, you know, we get cold here and it, it, they only work when their temperatures are 20 degrees Fahrenheit or above or something like that, which is really, really I, I, wrong when when you talk about the current models of air source heat pumps they may be that may be correct for air source heat pumps that existed for 50 years ago uh, 40 years ago it's less than that but it's not correct anymore yeah and and you know the stuff that we have today that's being sold in vermont um it will give you uh in in fact some of the models that you can get are are going to be good to 10 below zero uh, although at that at that level, they're not really heat pumps anymore. They're just going to use resistance. They're not heaters. working very well. But well, they, but they will. They have a they have a they have a resistance heater built in, so they will keep the house warm. Let me read this. When the north wind blows in Dillingham, Alaska, it can be well past 15 degrees below zero. On these days, the oil heaters in many homes have to pr have to run pretty much nonstop to keep people warm. But one house, and that's the one you're looking at, um, is kept warm by an air source heat pump. That particular house uh, was one that was occupied by one of the NREL National Renewable Energy Lab uh, scientists. And, you know, he lived in it for years, tiny as it is, apparently and uh, found it comfortable to live in. Well, right behind where I live, there's a tiny house. Yeah. And it's heated by an air source heat pump. Yeah. And as we speak right now, within about 10 feet of my car is this air source heat <laughs> pump. Yeah. 
I spoke to the owners of the house, and they put the heat pump in after they bought the house. Uh huh. And, and I asked them what they thought of it. They said they love it. Yeah. They, they they love it so much they put an air source heat pump in at their house in Dumberston. Well, there you go. I know that uh, Jason Cooper, who uh, has a number of units around Brattleboro and also has solar. Right around in that same area. Yeah, he he actually that's true. He's got several buildings, although he's got, he's got a, a group of buildings on Elliott Street that are heated by uh, wood chips and they have a it's a it's a centralized heating system, which is very, very efficient. But he ha he uses heat pumps in a lot of places and he's had a lot of experience with them. Well, OK, I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown on what air source heat pumps actually are. Oh, OK. They take heat from the outside air, and it, no, no matter how cold it is, there's always heat in it. Okay. Yeah. And they run it through a refrigeration cycle, just like your refrigerator, but but running in reverse. Yeah. And they deliver that heat to a building. It sounds unbelievable, but, you know, if you think about the refrigerator and the freezer, the freezer works by taking heat out of the freezer area and putting it into the room that the freezer is in. in the air. And it's like, how do they do that? Well, I could explain it. I'm sure Tom could explain it, but um, it works. Okay. Should we go on, Tom? Well, one good thing is, one thing is that the reason why these things are becoming more popular is because of the relatively low installed cost. Yes. No chimney, no fuel tank, no combustion. Yep. The only and, thing is you have to have electricity to make them work. Or a reasonable alternative. Or a reasonable alternative. Well, you and know, it's, it, it's another thing about it. They can provide both heating and cooling. Yes, that's true. Um, and, you know, the articles that, that we have in Green Energy Times, when I write an article about heat pumps for, for any reason, I usually add to it. If people are going to have heat pumps, it's a good idea to have um, some sort of some heat source such as um, a a wood stove or something well, like that. Well, electric heater just for those really cold days. Yeah, well, also for power outages. That's and for power outages, yeah. Yeah. You well, need, electric heater's not going to work, so you need a little wood stove. Yeah, it's a good idea. Okay, I am I think we should go on to the next one, Tom. Well, we got a picture, a very interesting picture of a Kubota farm track. <laughs> or at least the bottom 95% of it. I don't know why they didn't include the entire tractor in this picture, but they, they didn't. Okay, this is um, this particular article is also from Clean Technica. What do you have for a title? Farming and construction. Autonomous is going to be more than vehicles. Yeah. Um, there's a whole world of autonomy going on on farms and construction sites, and we could miss it while we tend to get focused on cars. Clean Technica, which is where this appears, has a lot of articles on cars, but you know, this one was ab about autonomy without cars. And of course, these vehicles that they're talking about are all electric. Machine what learning. What you're talking about, it starts up, attaches yeah. itself to implements, and goes yeah. to work. And it goes to work. Um, you send a drone out to check the field and tell us to tractor how much fertilizer to use. Yeah, and and there's there are a bunch of there are a bunch of things that you can do. You know, there are there are autonomous vehicles that can go down the rows in a in a in a in a, in a uh, farm field and actually do the weeding. Okay. And you know, if you think about that. That that means you don't need that you don't need herbicides anymore. I prefer goats myself, but <laughs> you know, you remind me of a of a of a thing I saw about strawberries, and the uh, there was a tractor trailer, and they opened up the doors, and all of a sudden, you know, five hundred geese came running out, and the <laughs> geese went run, the geese went running into the strawberry field where they ate the weeds. Geese like weeds, but apparently they don't particularly like strawberries. <laughs> the fortuitous event. Yeah. Okay. We should probably by go. Way, by the way, Caterpillar has mining trucks that will operate on it autonomously. Yeah. I had forgotten about that, but that's true. And they're, they're big trucks. 
You better believe it. Yeah, I guess so. Okay, our next. Let's, let's take a quick look here at a blade menu manufacturing company. Yeah, this is from Renews. And I want to, I want to, I know Tom will do this anyway, but I'll, I'll do it myself this time. I want you, I want everybody to look into the lower left corner of that screen. Those are people. Those are, those are, <laughs> those are not puppets. Those are actual people. This thing is very big. And there, there are places in the world where if you just stuck this turban down, somebody would be moved into it the next day, you know? Anyway, well, what these, do you, these things have gotten so big that you just about can't transport them on roads anymore. Yeah. What do you have for a title? GE to build a UK Haliotic blade factory. Yeah, and, and we these talked about what the Haliotic is. Oh it's yeah. Different. And these things you you really can't transport the Halyard X uh, blades on roads. They're only used offshore. GE Renewable Energy is investing in a new blade factory at Teesside, Northeast England. The factory will make blades for Halyard X units and they will, uh, it will create 750 jobs at the blade factory um, on the Tees River, on the River Tees, it's called T-E-E-S, as well as 1,500 more indirect jobs, and it'll be open and producing blades in 2023. That well, is- what, what they're saying here is the plant will be supplying blades to the Dogger Bank offshore yes. wind farm, which is now being developed in three phases off the northeast coast of England. Yeah. Collectively, they will be the world's largest offshore wind facility. Right. Okay. We are up to uh, Friday, March 12th, and we have a picture here of oh. the Mount Athos Monastery, which is, uh, this is Greece, isn't it? This is in Greece. It's, yeah. It's, it's very old, and it's actually about 12 monasteries. This this is a big thing in Greece if you're Greek or Greek Orthodox religion. Right. Um, this is from a, a publication called The Greek Reporter. And what do you have for title, Tom? The Mount Athos monastic community to use 100% renewable energy. Greece's ancient monastic community, Mount Athos, which is home to approximately 2,000 Orthodox monks, will soon be re- uh, begin receiving its electricity from solar panels, according to an, an announcement from the governor of central Greece. And I want to point out, when when they say they're soon receiving electricity from solar panels, this particular um, place where 2,000 people live has never had any electricity in the past. This is an entirely new thing for them. They have had oil power generators individually. Oh, did they? Okay. I thought... They've never been connected to the grid. (laughs) Yes. Okay. They never had any grid electricity. Yeah. Yeah, that's... uh, Getting rid of oil power generators is a good thing, I think. Those things are smoky. Do you have more on that? Well, it's just that they're completely going to cover Mount Athos' energy needs. Yeah. And we got well, another picture coming up of carbon engineering pilot plant. Yes, and this is from the what BBC. What do they mean by that? <laughs> well, <laughs> why don't you read the title, and, we, and I'll read the blurb, and then we can discuss it. The multi-trillion dollar plan to capture CO2. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> when it starts operating, Carbon Engineering's prototype direct air ca- uh, capture plant will scrub a ton of CO2. This is actually T O N N E ton, so it's a metric ton. Every year to stop climate change, we have to remove CO2 from the air faster than we put it in. Carbon Engineering. Yeah. We have to take it out faster than it goes in. And Carbon Engineering estimates that it will cost $94 per metric ton to remove it. We emit 34 billion metric tons per year. So you multiply 34 billion times $94, and that's how much money we would have to spend every year on carbon capture. And guess what? That doesn't even figure out what we're going to do with the carbon when we've caught it. That unit is going is 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 going to take out one metric ton per year. I think planting trees might be cheaper. What do you think, Tom? 
Well, <laughs> plenty of cheese works, but it takes a long time. Yep, it does. Although if you plant birch trees and trees like that, you can, you can, you know, a, there are birch trees that die because of their, they're getting too old when they're 30 years old. Well, that's still 30 years. These things are doing it right away. Yeah, I know. I, I'm not, you know, I, I guess Tom, you may be more impressed by the idea of capturing carbon emissions than I am. It's not something I find terribly impressive. Um, well, it's, it's a step in the right direction. That's all. It's, it's better off to, re, to not to have the emissions in the first place. Uh, that's the reason why I'm not particularly enthralled with this idea. We don't need to make carbon emissions. I, I, you know, the more I get through this, the more I see we can do everything using solar, wind, geothermal, hydropower, uh, and, and a little bit of biomass, I think, is probably going to be necessary. And the bi the, it is necessary for us to go into biomass because we've got to treat our waste. And that's well, biomass. Economics are working in that direction. Yes, that's true. Okay. No, it really doesn't make sense to pay for fuel when you don't have to. <laughs> I guess that's true. Okay. You want to go on, Tom, or do you have more here? Uh, well, they're talking about financing this and advocating for a global carbon tax, which I think is a good idea. Yeah, but I think it would be better to put the tax into other things than capturing carbon. Yeah. And anyway, he, we, have an, we have an item coming up from a, a publication called The Rob Report, R-O-B-B. -B. I don't recall ever having seen it before. But it, got a picture of a really nice catamaran. Yeah, this is a nice catamaran. Um, I don't know whether, I guess people really can't see. Um, those are chairs that are on the, on the upper deck there. Um, <clears throat> and that roof over the upper deck is, is high enough that people can walk around under that. And then well, that roof up top is all solar. Yeah, that's right. And those, I think those, those little dot things that are all over the, all over the pontoon section are, are they're probably, solar too. they're solar too. And I noticed that there are windows. They're very conventional looking home style windows in that, um, in that pontoon. There's, probably exa more just exactly like them those those are i'm just going to guess that those are um those windows are for living quarters that are in, in that in that area and uh, of course they're claiming that this particular yacht can be powered entirely by the sin wind and the sun and i i'm just struck it's kind of stunning the idea that we could go all over the world without using any fuel and rely on wind power for propulsion of ships. What do you think of that, Tom? They do that. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to say that. <laughs> Didn't they do that 200 years ago? Yeah, they did. But now let's, what... Let's read the title here anyhow. Okay. Sun Reef's new all-electric camera blends solar and wind energy for unlimited range. Unlimited range. You could go to the moon and back. Sun Reef's Yachts is building what it claims to be the world's most advanced, sustainable luxury catamaran. It can heart, which, by the way, is if you want to translate that, it means neither Tom nor I can afford one of these things. It can harness more and store renewable energy, and it can sail silently, emissions-free for days on end. In fact, the yard says it has infinite range. So it's not just the moon you can go to. You can go to Alpha Centauri. There's some very interesting pictures on this uh, website. Yeah, a lot of it, uh, it, really good pictures. Yeah, I, I like them. We, we talked about a catamaran before, but it didn't really exist. This does exist. You can buy one of these. You can buy one. There you go. Well, so. the special features a special solar skin. If you look at the picture up close, you can see it. Integrated into the hull. Well, yeah. I guess it's in those interesting pics on a website. Um, it's in, right into the hull. I mean, it, they, they just bury these solar panels. Not solar panels, but little solar cells. Cells everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. And, you know, all of that picks up, um, picks up light, which is 
translated into uh, electricity. And then, of course, they've got storage. And they can run this thing um, on electricity that's been saved in their batteries. So they can just keep going. Absolutely. And this yeah. is an interesting thing. While under sail, the vessel recovers energy from the propeller rotation. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, we should probably go to the next item, which is from Clean Technica. I've got a picture here of wetlands. Picture of some wetlands, yeah. Yeah. This is a very thoughtful article. Yes. It's a long article, but it's very thoughtful. This is worth reading. Uh, by the way, we're at Saturday, March 13th, in case you need to know that. Um, what do you have for a title, Tom? We are losing the Earth's diversity of life due to economics. Yes, we that's are. Worth, that's worth contemplating. Yes, it is. We are plundering every corner of the world, apparently neither knowing, knowing nor caring what the consequences might be to the diversity of life. Putting things right will take a collaborative effort of every nation on Earth. And this is according to a study from the UK government. And wetlands are one of those areas that are extremely um, useful for, uh, for, store, uh, for taking carbon out of the air. I know that doesn't look like it would work as well as a forest, but it is better. And they, Well, the article says a, a good, good question. How long can we continue to assume that the biosphere is external to the human economy? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, this is one of the problems with the so-called free market economics is that the companies that we've got and many of the people who are in economics seem to think that nothing really has any value unless you can put a price on it. So what's the price that you put on the love you have for your children. What What is the price that you put on a, a beautiful sunset? Well, what do you, what's the price? There's a lot of things you can't put a price on. And you yeah, exactly. But that doesn't, you know, if I don't know, but I, I would feel very strongly that if you go to people and say, if you had a choice and you, and you could get either one or the other, but not both, would you rather be rich or would you rather have a lot of love in your life? I think most people would go for the love. Most people. Not all. Not all. But I think most people would go for the love. Okay. What that means is, if, that, if I'm correct in that, then love is more important than money. And if love is more, than, more important than money, then how do, you, how, you, how do you monetize it? And the same thing is true of the environment. Absolutely. Is, is the environment money worth more or is money worth more? What is the, what's the dollar value of that wetlands? What's the well, again, from the article, by bringing economics and ecology together, we can help save the natural world. Right. That what may be the last minute. Yeah, that's true. In, in doing so, save ourselves. It feels like we're getting close to the last minute, doesn't it? Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica. This and is an interesting picture. I, yeah, I want to tell you, I'm not responsible for the colors in this picture. Not me. I didn't do that to you. So let's LIDAR, not radar. That's right. And, and uh, if you look at that picture in the back, there's a suspension bridge. There is indeed. So and what LIDAR is, LIDAR predated the radar, really. LIDAR and, did? Uh, well, it, not in its form, but yes, that was the first radar the first precursor to radar and radar was much more efficient for doing what they wanted. Well, yeah. Radar is, is more efficient. Um, so LIDAR may be harmful to people and to cameras. All right. LIDAR is dependent on lasers. Am I right about that, Tom? You are. That's, that's the difference between the early LIDAR and today's LIDAR. They oh, okay. The the current lidar that people use is dependent on lasers, which makes sense because they they can oh absolutely they can shine out a tiny dot, and it's really easy to keep track of where that dot is using uh, using a a camera and and uh, uh, you know computers. All right, let, you've read the title. Let me read the the the. Uh, blurb here. A story in truckinginfo.com questions the safety of LIDAR systems used in ve vehicles, not Tesla, by the way. 
Some types of LIDAR could potentially cause damage to human eyes, while other types could hurt cameras that are used for safe operation of vehicles and traffic equipment. And, you know, this guy is not joking about this. There was, he's got a, an example of a camera that had a spot put in because an area in the, in the system that was tracking the light was destroyed by by a laser laser beam that was. Nobody thought that was going to happen. Nobody thought it would happen. That's right, and so well, there. Where, where, where this is really uh, important now is many new cars have lidar built in to for the car to to notice if there's any other cars nearby that may be causing a problem. Right. This is starting to become part part of ordinary cars today. Yes. And they're not even autonomous cars. Yes. And actually, you know, you're bringing something up that I think should be stressed here. We're talking about LIDAR potential has it having a potential to damage somebody's eyes. And the reason they're putting it in is because they want to reduce the potential of killing people. So this is not a, this is not a simple, let's not do that operation. It would be interesting to know how Tesla does it because they use a different system. And um, maybe, you know, we're going to ditch this particular system for this particular use. But nevertheless, it's something to talk about. Well, I think they went ahead and did this not realizing that the LIDAR could hurt people. Well, eyes. they did the calculations, and the calculations said you, you're not going to hurt anybody with this. And then, you know, it turned out that they might be wrong. Okay, we have to get going to our next item, if unless you've got some objection, Tom. Well, we got a wonderful picture of a rusty pipeline. <laughs> a wonderful picture of a beautiful picture of a rusty pipeline. This article is from Clean Technica. Pipeline firms are abandoning oil and gas lines, leaving landowners to deal with the mess. This why, is why, why am I surprised? Yeah, uh, I, the first question you ask is why are you surprised, and the second question which I'm going to ask is why would we ever permit this to happen? There are a few rules governing abandoned pipelines which can collapse, explode, leak dangerous chemicals. It's a problem that is increasingly common as renewables outcompete fossil fuels and pipelines age out of service, and. You know, the, 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 the stories in this article about the people who have a piece of property that has a pipeline on it and they want to do something and the pipeline is just there and they find that they can get somebody who will take the pipeline out of the ground and salvage the parts for a small amount of money. A thousand dollars, I think, was the amount that they said, but they have to get the permission from the company that owns the abandoned pipeline. And the company that owns the abandoned pipeline wants to have its own contractors do the job for 50 times what the property owner would pay to the people who've already bid on it. Ain't that neat, huh? Oh, it, it, it's well, really- it's almost as much as that. You there, Tom? Uh, I was going I'm to. Here, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I I was going to say, you know, this is something that we should we should have a a reasonable approach to pipelines, which says before you even put the pipeline in, it it should be a requirement that everybody know how it's going to be removed and when. So, you know. Well, it costs almost as much to get a pipeline out of the ground as it costs to put it in. Yeah, well, the, the, the one that we're looking at here is going to be relatively cheap because it's not in the ground. But it also happens that this pipeline is not in the United States. It's in, in the Ukraine or someplace like that. Okay, more on well, that. There's some, three million miles, there's some three million miles of natural gas pipelines buried in the United States. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. It's depressing, isn't it? Well, and this is this, this, this is a depressing thing. Pipeline company have no obligation to remove old pipelines. That's because when it was Kirk put, can order a pipeline company. 
I was saying FERC can order a pipeline company to remove the line, but just because they have the authority doesn't mean they will exercise. Yeah, and not only that, but FERC ordering somebody doesn't to do something doesn't mean that that person is going to do it. And, um, you know, th Bingo. this is a this is a complicated issue, which should have been addressed when the pipelines were put in to begin with. They should have said, if you're going to put this pipeline in, we want to know the date that it's going to be removed and you have to pay for removal. OK, we're up to Sunday, March 14th, and we have an item from N-O-L-A dot com and a picture of a bayou in Louisiana. Down on the bayou. <laughs> oh, dear. What do you have for a title, Tom? A victory. Just about to read it. A victory in the fight to save our, our coast. But the war isn't won. Yeah. Louisiana coastal advocates have been celebrating the release of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers environmental impact study on the state's proposed Myrtle Grove River, river sediment diversion. It is to cost $50 billion. Well, you know, that's not much these days. But, um, but it won't be $50 billion because climate change just keeps on going. And basically what they're saying is this, this is going to be a constant. It's not going to be a $50 pay down and then you're done. This is going to be an ongoing effort. Capture. On and on and on. Yeah. Um, the idea they, here. They call it this is a forever. They, in the article it says this is a forever war. If we ever stop, ever withdraw from the fight, the Gulf of Mexico will win. Yeah, this is going to be an ongoing thing. We have to capture sediment from the Mississippi River and dump it in Lu into Louisiana in order to build up the land in Louisiana so, because the, the land is subsiding and the, and the ocean is rising. Now, in the meantime, they may be able to save the m parts of, Miss of Louisiana from the Mississippi River, but they're not going to save the Gulf Coast. They're just, you know... They don't have yeah, enough. Yeah, bingo. You're right. Yeah. Okay. We, should, we have to get going. The time is catching up with us. We've got a picture of rubber trees in Thailand. In the article, the title is The Wonder Material We All Need But Is Running Out. Right. And this is from the BBC. Rubber is of such uh, global importance that it is included on the EU's list of critical raw, raw materials. Unfortunately, there are signs that the world might be running out of natural rubber. Disease, climate change and plunging global prices have put the world's rubber supplies into jeopardy. Well, this article is true as it says, but it's oriented toward Europe, and we've got a little bit of a different situation here. Okay. Uh, in the years before World War II, the Japanese started preventing our access to the south to Southeast Asia. Yep. Oil and rubber. Yep. Okay, so we developed synthetic rubbers for almost all the rubber we need. Yeah. And so we're not using so much natural rubber. We stopped well, basically using natural rubber when a blight killed the Brazilian rubber tree. Yeah, and and actually, if you think about this, one of the one of the uh, threats to the global supply of rubber is plunging global prices. The prices are going down, and that's a threat. Well, why are the prices going down? You know. Basically, what it means is that the demand for rubber is probably going down, even though there is disease, climate change, and 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 such problems. So, I think this is a, a more complicated issue than than um, the BBC gave it credit for. Well, they don't really mention the synthetic rubber taking over. Oh, the synthetic rubber, as you said, you know, during Second World War, we needed rubber. We made it synthetically. And and there it is. Okay. We, we even this sounds like an oxymoron, but we can even make synthetic natural rubber. <laughs> we can make synthetic natural gas. We can make synthetic natural hydrogen. We can synthesize all kinds of natural things. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we can synthesize a Tesla, a Tesla mega pack. 
Yeah, that's well, what we're looking at now. Yeah, that's what we're looking at now. That is not a storage facility. You cannot store one of those bays, uh, rent one of those bays. That is a big battery. Well, you can store things in it, electrons. <laughs> yeah, right. I suppose that's true. Uh, what do you got for a title? Will Tesla help prevent another energy disaster in Texas? Yeah, our neighbors. And, and by the way, there's going to be a second ar article about this specific problem that we're going to hit, talk about this week. Our neighbors in Texas got hit hard by the recent unexpected Arctic blast. Weather related disaster was an embarrassing fiasco that simply would not should not have happened in a technologically advanced country. But now Tesla is boosting its presence in Texas with stationary batteries. And there it is. You know, you've got the wind turbines in the background and corn growing. Well, Global Energy Storage, <laughs> which is a Tesla subsidiary, is building a 100 megawatt energy storage project. Yep. And that is going to help in future problems in Texas. Now, we, Bloomberg we has been watching this, and they predict that two gigawatts, two gigawatts, of battery storage is getting hooked up to the Texas grid. Yeah, well, as I said, we're going to have another story about exactly this thing uh, you know, on this particular show. Well, let's move in that direction. Yep. And a nice picture of Mamora Bay. Okie doke. Let's bring it up. There it is. <laughs> Solar led renewable energy system could free up to 10% of a Caribbean nation's GDP. This is from PV Magazine International. Uh, for Antigua and Barbuda, IRENA, which is the International Renewable Energy um, a a Agency, I believe, um, proposed 199 megawatt of solar capacity in a near 90% clean energy system with 57% solar generation. Diesel would make up just 8%, down from its current 96%, which well, that's caught, a trip in the right direction. Yeah, I suppose it is. That diesel, ninety-six percent of the of the uh, of the electricity is using up ten percent of the gross domestic domestic product of the com company. So they would they would be freeing up. It's the title says ten percent. It would be more like nine percent. But it would mean it, it, the company is getting a a, a nine percent raise. Let me put it that way, where they're they're going to have local very low priced power instead of having to pay for diesel fuel. Well, where is Antigua and Barbuda is the name of a country. It's a country. That's right. And it's about the seven or eight small islands that are east and south of Puerto Rico. Right. And they call them the Leeward Islands. Leeward. I always said Leeward. Well, that's probably right. <laughs> I think either one is right, Tom. The wind is coming from from that direction. Yes, that's right. And and they're moving toward an entirely renewable energy system by 2030, which is coming up soon, fellas. Yeah, and and you know that's a that's it, it, that's a common type of goal for these island nations, because one of the things that has been holding them back for a long time has been um, oil fired power. Okay, we should keep going, Tom. Thank you, down there. Yep. Here is a picture of a training session using a solar cooker. I actually have a solar cooker. Do you really? I do. This is from PV Magazine International. You can do, make good stew on one. It would seem to me to be a useful thing to have if you're going on a Sunday picnic. If you're going on something like that, but also, you know, you can you can cook without using any energy. Sure. At least not any energy that you would pay for. And all, there are a lot of things that you can cook very well. I said stew, soup. You can make uh, fix squash in there, um, other kinds of vegetables. All kinds of things can be. Th there are people who bake in these things. Okay, what do you got for title? Why, why, why should you pay for power when you can get it for nothing? Exactly. What do you got for a title? Solar power lights up a Sudanese refugee camp. And that's what we're looking at there. Yeah. By the way, I, have to, I have to comment on the beauty of that woman's dress. Oh yes, <laughs> it is. It's. It looks like a lidar uh, picture that has been <laughs> torn apart and put back together again. This is from UN News, so it's actually a UN um, report. 
Um, in eastern Sudan, renewable energy is being trialed as a power source at UN-run refugee camps, where an influx of thousands of people fleeing conflict in Ethiopia is putting a strain on local resources and host communities. Their only other option is to go out and cut down trees for fuel. Not a good idea. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's nice to leave the trees and use the sunshine. And of course, these people are, and when you have a situation like this, you can just use the sunshine. You don't have to spend time going out, finding trees, um, cutting them, bringing them back, drying them out. There's a lot of work in, you know, walking several miles to some stand of forest, which really the world would be better off if it were left there. But reading into the program, this UN development outfit is providing hundreds of these cookers. Yeah, hundreds of them. In fact, the, the organization that I bought mine from, and mine is pretty good, and I don't remember the name of the organization. I had a, they had a, um, a uh, um, GoFundMe or you know similar funding thing for the for the to 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 distribute the solar cookers and the way that it worked was if you bought if you put money into the the fund they would supply a free solar cooker somewhere in the world which you could specify the country and they would also give you a solar cooker so that's that's what i did yeah it was it was a pretty good deal i think somebody else got something out of it you have more on that no, let's move on. We got a nice picture of one of those things. A uh, hmm. wind turbines. I think they might be, and, the, and you'll notice that the the name of the guy who took the picture um, doesn't the last name doesn't have any vowels. <laughs> <laughs> you know what can I say? That's there are a lot of languages that do that. This particular um, article. Uh, which does not have this picture, which is why it's from Unsplash. This particular article came from uh, Clean Technica. The U.S. Clean, in capital letters, Future Act. What's in it? Yeah. Uh, clean, clean stands for Climate Leadership and Environmental Act. Yeah, they must have spent all afternoon figuring that out. Oh, they pay somebody the big bucks to think that. Yeah, that's right, the big bucks. The Clean Future Act was on March 2nd. 2011, uh, 2021, and it deserves some special attention as it is the first major piece of climate legislation to be introduced since President Biden assumed office. Here we give a brief, we give brief outlines of its major features as well as some important measures that are not in it. And this is the article that I referred to when I said there's no way we're going to be able to pick this thing apart in any kind of detail on the show. Um, There's but, a very long article. There's, there's nine features, nine outlines that they talk about. Yep, if and, we have time, I'll tell you what they are. But I don't think we have time. I don't think we have time. But there, there's nine that they had talked about, and there are a bunch that they did not talk about. One of them was carbon tax. Another one was how are we going to phase out the use of fossil fuels for transportation? And, um, you know, all of this could be planned. I, I don't know how, how that's going to be addressed. My guess is that when, when the time comes to phase out fossil fuels for transportation, it's kind of ha going to happen all by itself. But that's going to be a little... Well, economics is going to do it. I think so. And it's going to be uncomfortable for those people who still have fossil fuel-based cars when they discover that there's only one gas station in town and it's about to close. So, okay, our next issue... Our next issue. Our next. Where am I? You're looking at a picture of Deb Holland. I am looking at a picture of Deb Holland, but on my on my other. Um, oh, there it is. My other computer, the one that I have the script on, is not behaving properly. OK, this is from CNN. What do you have for a title? Get it. Confirms Deb Holland as Biden's. Interior Secretary in historic vote. Right. The Senate voted to confirm Deb, ha Deb Holland as President Joe Biden's Interior Secretary, a historic move that will make her the first Native American Cabinet Secretary. Holland will be important for Biden's plan to tackle climate change and reduce carbon emissions. Now, I want to point out 
Deb Holland is American Indian. And yes. uh, I use that term in preference to Native American. I had a, a friend um, 30 years ago who I haven't seen in 20 years, why, which is why I put it in the past tense. And he, I asked him, how do you feel about the terms Native American and, and Indian? He said he preferred Indian because he, he said everybody knows it's not true. Nobody, nobody tries to make anything out of this. But Native American, he, he didn't like because he said, where are you born? I said, Kansas. He said, you see, you're a Native American. Um, and well, in the article, they use the word indigenous person. Indigenous person. Well, unfortunately, indigenous person is also, I don't know. But the, the, the point here is the American Indians have always dealt with the, um, the uh, Interior Department of the United States, which has been about as honest in its dealings as the average con artist. And, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a kind of general way of saying it, isn't it? Oh, you know, I, I've had people say that the, the whole design of the of the um, Hitler's design of the uh, of the uh, concentration camps was based on American, the way Americans treated the American Indians. It's really well, it's a very simple sentence. We stole their land. What's that? A very simple sentence. We stole their land yeah absolutely that's what we did we, we stole their land um in 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 many many cases almost all cases there were a couple of cases where we for example bought uh manhattan island for 24 bucks um i think y you and i could probably come up with that amount of money couldn't we for manhattan at the beginning of the month i can <laughs> OK, listen, um, this is a significant item. And here you're seeing De Deb Holland at the top of a wind turbine. But we have to get going because we we don't have much um, time. So if you don't mind, Tom, well, I got a couple of quick takeaways here. Go ahead. Trump stacked his cabinet with climate skeptics. We know that. Yeah, we we know. Okay? And one of the things about Deb Holland, she has sponsored the the Green New Deal resolution in the House of Representatives. Right. This is a woman who came from Congress. I mean, she originally came from. Um, You're going to be hearing more about this. Today. I think she's got a lot going for her. She has. Uh, she's one of those these people who is really kind of special, I think. OK, our next item is a Wurzilla factory. Yeah, we got <laughs> that. I can guarantee you that's a lot bigger than a football field. Yes. And uh, this item is from Clean Technica. What do you have for a title? Wartzilla providing 200 megawatts in a form of a 214.5 megawatt hour battery storage for a Texas grid. And it's right. more than that storage. Wartzilla Energy has installed uh, 72 gigawatts of power, power plant capacity in 180 countries around the world. Gigawatts, now, gigawatts, baby. Yeah, it is. And now, most of that, truthfully, is probably coal and natural gas and diesel. Um, but now it's bringing its expertise to, to Texas to help stabilize the state's utility grid with two 100 megawatt battery storage facilities, giving a combination uh, uh, combined energy storage of 214.5 megawatt hours. So they're expected to go into service next January. Yep. OK, our next item is from Clean Technica. And here we have a picture of the Northvolt Et factory. It's a gigafactory in Sweden, and I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of the city. <laughs> Volkswagen orders $14 billion worth of battery cells from Northvolt. As part of Volkswagen's Power Day, news came out that Volkswagen Group has put in an order for $14 billion dollars worth of battery cells a billion dollars worth is a big a dollars worth from Northvolt. can you imagine taking an order you know hello uh, mr jones uh can i help you yes i want 14 billion dollars worth of batteries how would you feel <laughs> it, it will be supplied by Northvolt swedish battery factory the 14 billion dollars is for 
10 years worth of battery supplies. So this is a, an order that says we want $1.4 billion on average for each of the next 10 years. Well, it's interesting because Volkswagen is, is a part owner of North Pole. Yes. You just think about this. If you were a salesman and you had a 1% commission, that one sale would earn you $140 million. Ah, very interesting. <laughs> do you have more on that, Tom? I don't think I do. I don't. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> Here is, I don't know what these things are. Let's move on to our St. Patrick's Day special. Okay. Wednesday, March 17th. Yes, absolutely. March 17th. I did, by the way, have uh, uh, corned beef and cabbage yesterday. Good for you. I had corned beef and cabbage the day before, and I had corned beef and cabbage today. I live alone, so one piece of corned beef lasts me a long time. Okay, this is from Renews. Stockcraft wraps up a one gigawatt Fosin project, whatever Fosin means. Well, okay. yeah, um, Fosin is... Um, well, okay, let me read this. Stotcraft completed Europe's largest onshore wind project, the 1,057 megawatt Fosun wind development, comprising 277 turbines across six wind farms in Norway. That's the wind, a gigawatt. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's more than a gigawatt. The wind farms are in the Trondelag region of Norway on the country's west coast. I, Norway actually does have a north coast and a south coast, but yes, it no, does. not very big. They will supply up to 3.6 terawatt hours of electricity every year. Now, I, th I don't remember exactly, but my, my recollection is I think Vermont uses about six terawatts of electricity terawatt hours of electricity each year so these this one development would supply approximately half of vermont's electricity okay no, okay there it is you have more on that oh not not worth talking about Let's okay we are in guernsey how about that i've never been in guernsey you've been in guernsey tom oh. Been in Guernsey. Guernsey's an interesting place. Kind of pretty looking place, too. It, it is, too. I have never been in Guernsey, but I have been in Jersey. They're right, right adjacent to each other. They're, yeah, they're, they're just a, a short distance apart. I flew pretty into far, Jersey. Pretty far away from England. Uh, closer to France. And as a matter of fact, the people who live here speak um, French. Um, but it's a. Uh, it's it's not exactly a UK possession. It's it's kind of got a weird special status. Well, the Queen owns it. Yeah, the Queen owns it. That's right. Yeah. Okay. This is from ITV News. ITV is independent television in in the UK. Guernsey's electricity is a hundred percent renewable. Yep. Let's All hear it. Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> Yay, Yay, Guernsey. Guernsey. <laughs> All of Guernsey's electricity that is imported from France last year was from renewable sources. The utility company, Guernsey Electric, has received verification of its guarantees of origin certificate, which shows where in France the electricity was produced and how it was produced over the last 12 months. So Guernsey apparently is not doing any local uh, fossil fuel based electricity they sure as blazes don't have any nuclear power stations and they're buying their electricity from france specifying that they want renewable power as opposed to you know historically in the not very distant past 75 percent of the electricity in france came from the country's uh 50 i'm going to say 57 i might be wrong about that but they have a lot of nuclear power plants and they're actually taking uh, power plants out to replace them because they uh, they want to have higher um, uh, percentage of renewables. And as those power nuclear plants age, some of them are not going to be replaced. Well, I'll read one sentence that, that answers that. Oh, okay. The solar energy, 19%, comes from Normandy. Wind energy, 23%, comes from the Loire Valley. Yep. And hydro... 
fifty-eight percent comes from Brittany. Yep, there you go. That's a hundred percent. That's a hundred. There's also community solar PV arrays on the island. On the island, that you know, I was going to say they it, the French are not supplying a hundred percent of the electricity. There is some local power, but the PV arrays are the ones that are supplying supplying the local energy. And of course, the people on Guernsey could build those PV arrays bigger. And by the way, as I as I mentioned this, Tom, I was yes. uh, doing the news today, and I noticed that um, according to one of the articles that I that I read today. Uh, there are two articles I'd like to I'd like to comment on. It'd be pretty cl- quick. We've only got one article left to talk about on the show. Um, the first one is the amount of solar capacity in the world is increasing, has increased in the last ten years at an average rate of forty two percent per year. I was wow. That means that it's economic. The the amount of solar capacity is is doubling every 1.7 years. That's amazing. The other thing, and we will be talking about this next week. Um, it, I th- it was I'm thinking BMW, but it wasn't. It was Audi. Audi announced that they have stopped all development of internal combustion engines. Very interesting. I didn't Isn't hear it? That. Well, they're 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 in the they're in the news today, and they will be uh, two of the items that we talk about in the first day for, of next week. But well, we should we'll talk about it next week. But it makes sense. Yeah, it sure does. We have one more item, which nice is picture here coming up. Really <laughs> yeah, I you know I went to Unsplash and I just said I want a picture of nature, and I had lots and lots of pictures to choose from. But this is the one that I chose. This. Uh, uh, article came from the BBC. The human right that benefits nature. This, I think, is a really interesting article. Important. People should know about it. We should do it. More than 100 constitutions around the world have adopted a human right to a healthy environment, which is proving to be a powerful way to protect the nat- natural world. A clean and healthy environment is a human need for life as we balance ecosystems, biodiversity, and other elements of nature. So well, the takeaway here is just like food, work, housing, and education, an all-around healthy environment should be considered a human right. Yes, absolutely. A healthy environment should be considered a human right. And that means that, you know, the fossil fuel companies are trying to take our lives away, our rights away. And, you know, I just I, I can't see that any other way than, than to see it the way that I just said it. Well, there are some people that believe that no enterprise is worth pursuing unless somebody's making money on it. Yeah, right. And you know what? Uh, tell an amateur uh, painter that or a person who, who is an amateur who plays a guitar. There's an either of those. There are enterprises that people pursue and they don't make money at it. But they do it because they love it. And, you know, it's we're back to how much what is the dollar value of love? And is is love more important than money? And, you know, these are these are issues that I think we have to we have to deal with. Okay, we have one last we have one last slide slide, which is just a sign that says have a an invigoratingly refreshing week. And so Tom and I, for that. <laughs> Tom and I are going to do what we always do, which is to wave goodbye. I am, in fact, waving, and I can guarantee anybody who's watched this show will get a double his money back um, uh, value if Tom is not waving at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> you are, to, that's a bet you won't have to pay off. Yeah, are you waving, Tom? Well, I was. There you go. So we have Tom's testimony as to what that's all about. And I think we, Tom and I would like to invite everybody back next week for more um, in, uh, enlightening discussion of energy and climate change. You all come back and see it. Yeah. I hope they all do. Goodbye, Tom. Goodbye. <laughs>